Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Community Free Church. It's a joy to have you here with us to worship this morning. Now, if you would stand with us, I have a few brief announcements this morning uh, before we begin, and I will start with the most important one. So this will not be the last time that you hear this between now and next Sunday. If you're plugged into our email or on our church Facebook or YouTube accounts or whatever, but we are changing our service times starting next week. I know, gasp, maybe, maybe some rejoicing, that's how we feel. Um, so for those of you who, who have maybe come to different services than just the first one, you might know, our service times have felt a little bit tight and a little bit close together. And we feel that as pastors here at this church acutely, and I know a lot of you do too. So what we're going to do is we're going to push back our start times for, for the second two services. So if you come to first service, nothing changes. That will still be at 8.30. Second service will get pushed back to 10 o'clock, and third service will get pushed back to 11.30. Now, if you're like me, you're probably going to get hungry by that point, but we're going to do our best to provide, bring some snacks back into the cafe and help us go along with that. So 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30 will be our three new service times, and that will start next Sunday. And I'm sure you'll hear more about that throughout the week this week. Second thing is, you might have noticed as you walked in, in the lobby there, there's a table uh, for Operation Christmas Child. Um, so if you would like to, take a, take a uh, shoebox and fill it with uh, presents and toys, and those things go over to bless children on the other side of the world. So please grab one of those shoeboxes. Maybe fill it up with your family and then bring it back to us. Um, so the last announcement is that this is the last Sunday of kind of our stripped down uh, worship service. We'll have the full band back next week. But for those of you who might be new, the month of October, we've been giving our worship team the month off because of all their hard work they've been putting in since the pandemic has started. And so we don't have the screens working. So if you're, you're new here this morning or visiting with us, you can take one of the sheets from the center of the aisles there. And that's where all of our, our lyrics and our scripture for this morning Will be so if you would go ahead and grab one of those at this time and we'll begin our, our worship of the lord this morning in psalm 78 5 through 8 hear these words as we begin it says the lord established a testimony in jacob and appointed a law in israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. And that psalm reminds us that this morning as God's people, as we gather together to worship, what we are doing is we are remembering who we are. We're remembering what story we are a part of. That we are not individual people with our own individual life stories with us as the main character. But we are remembering that we are a part of a much larger story that God himself is telling. A story of salvation and redemption and into which we are invited to be a part. So let's remember this morning who our God is and what he has done and who we are in light of that. And let's sing together. Oh, the Lord, our strength and song, a highest praise to him belongs and christ the lord the conquering king your name we raise your triumph sing oh praise the lord Storms of 
together church and the Lord shall reign forever and ever the Lord shall reign forever and ever the Lord shall reign may be seated. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tony Pitts. I'm one of the pastor elders here, and I'm going to lead us in prayer this morning. Uh, I'm going to start out by reading from Psalm 121, if you want to turn there and read along, it's on page 484 in the Pew Bibles. So I'll give you a couple seconds to flip there. This is a good reminder of uh, why we pray, where our help comes from, who we pray to. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And I would just add, that's a really long time. Forevermore. And that's good news. So will you pray with me? Father God, we, we thank you this morning Lord, as we remember, as we remind one another of where our help comes from and how it is that you've made a way uh, for us to receive your help 
Lord, when we were cut off, when we were far away, that you've made a way for us to come near and uh, receive help forevermore. Um, Lord, we lift up the uh, team that's, that's going to Moorhead, North Carolina, Lord, to help with uh, hurricane relief next week. Uh, Father God, we, we pray that uh, you would help them to, to not just meet the temporal needs there, Lord, but that they would have opportunities to share the good news of who you are, what it is that you've done for us, and uh, what you can do for us forevermore. Uh, pray that you'd give them opportunities and uh, that they would seize those opportunities and make the most of them. Lord, we lift up uh, Neil and, and Tona Hess uh, as they minister to the refugees uh, and help them to uh, find a home here. Uh, pray that you would just give them endurance. Lord, give them your grace in increasing measure. Uh, help them to, uh, to make you known. And uh, I pray that, that we as a church, Lord, would be looking for ways to uh, support them in what they're doing, Lord, and uh, work together as, as a body. Um, pray for the pastor elders, Lord, here at, at Community, um, their families, as well as they look to, to serve um, and lead in a way that, that builds up the people here. And uh, for all the other ministries, Lord, that are uh, working hard to do that for, for your glory, Lord, the small group leaders and men's and women's ministry leaders, the children's ministry, uh, the Sunday school ministry, Lord, uh, people that are, that are volunteering to drive and make sure people get to church that couldn't get there otherwise. Uh, just pray that you would be with all of, all of us as, as we work to glorify you together. Um, and Father God, I, I pray for uh, the community around this church. Uh, Lord, we ask that, that you would help us to be a body of believers that makes you known uh, to this world that, that needs you so desperately. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. My name is Colton, and I have the honor of reading our scripture passage this morning. It's going to be Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 uh, through 13, and then verses 24 through 28. Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each person can eat, you shall, take, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike on all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. 
And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you or destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Then in verse 24, you shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. This is God's word. Thanks be to God for it. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Tony and Colton, uh, for reading our scripture this morning. We're going to be in the Passover story this morning, and I'm really grateful to be doing that. It's one of the most glorious stories in the Bible, and we get the opportunity to sit in it this morning. And so before we do that, let me pray for us. God, thank you that you have worked these wonders on behalf of your people and that you've given us an an account of it. We pray that you would humble us, that you would encourage us, challenge us, remind us of your mighty hand, your loving heart, and your commitment, your steadfast commitment to see us through, to carry us. Teach us, Lord. We submit to you and your presence among us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So everyone loves an underdog story, right? From Rocky to Slumdog Millionaire to the pursuit of happiness We love to see the down and out, the no-name character rise above the rest through perseverance and diligence and courage. The book of Exodus, and specifically the Passover, is not an underdog story. If we're honest, there's a kind of story that grips us even more than an underdog story. Redemption stories. Stories in which the down and out character can't save themselves, but are raised up through an act of self sacrificial love. This is the kind of story that we see here in Exodus 12. And this is not a story about the victory and strength of Israel but it's about the mighty arm and gracious heart of God to redeem his people for himself. It's a story about the people of Israel, and yet it's also our story. It's the story of the gospel, and it shows us the primary themes of God's redemptive activity in the world back then, in this moment, in the chapters and in the events that would follow, and right now in our lives, in our day, we see God doing three things in this story and in ours. God silences, God rescues, and God reminds. God silences. A few years ago, a friend and I decided that we wanted to hike a few peaks in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And I remember as we drove up to the peaks, we began to see storm clouds come in. And yet we decided we were going to forge on. We were going to hike anyways. And as we hiked, it began to drizzle a little bit. And then that drizzle turned into a windy rain, which turned into heavy rain, which turned into a torrential downpour. We were slipping, we were falling, 
The way up these mountains are filled with large boulders. My friend dislocated his finger and had me pull it out. (laughs) It was terrible. And still, we didn't turn back. We kept going. You would have thought we would have turned back. And we found our way to the top, which was about 5,000 feet up above sea level. And we found ourselves in an exposed field of boulders. And we were literally inside the storm clouds and thundering, rumbling in our chests, which means that lightning is close, which we saw. We felt our lives were on the line. And so we quickly found shelter in what felt like no shelter at all, a tiny little outcropping of boulders, wet, cold, and shaking, we waited it out, and we survived. We had opportunity after opportunity to turn back, but we didn't. It took the threat of death to stop us in our tracks. The Lord has demonstrated his supremacy over the gods of Egypt in the first nine plagues that he sent to them. But here in the final plague, he takes on the greatest idol in Egypt, Pharaoh himself. And God, with a final blow, silences him into submission. Read with me in chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Yet one more plague I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go. And when he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Verse 4. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. In this final plague, God doesn't just bring discomfort or disgust at rotting frogs or affliction, but death and despair. In chapter 1 of Exodus, if you remember, Pharaoh sought to preserve his throne by killing all of the babies, all of the baby sons born to the Hebrews. And here God demonstrates the supremacy of his throne by repaying Pharaoh what he did. God sends the angel of death, the destroyer, we read in verse 23 of chapter 12, to slay all the firstborn sons in Egypt. We need to feel the weight of what's happening here. God is doing something meaningful. The firstborn was always considered special. This was true not just of children, but of livestock and the fruit of the land. That which came first represented blessing from God. Fruitfulness, prosperity. It testified to the goodness that would follow. And in the context of a family, the firstborn son was the unique heir of the father's inheritance. In Pharaoh's case, his firstborn would have been in line for the throne and the supreme authority to rule Egypt. God doesn't end Pharaoh's life here. He ends his lineage. And in doing so, he declares that he doesn't just reign over the present Pharaoh, but over all those that would come after him. The Pharaoh who had broke the backs of the Israelites for over four centuries had cracked under the weight of God's mighty hand. The Pharaoh who had boasted in his sovereign power was powerless to save himself and his people. Pharaoh was shattered 
into silent submission with the blood of sons on his hands. For he had nine opportunities to turn back. And he said no every time. Therefore, the blood is on his hands. God often deals with us in a similar way that he deals with Pharaoh, albeit less severe. Because we can deal with God the way Pharaoh deals with God. Believing that we have power over our lives, that we can make it without him. Like Pharaoh, we can make idols that may not look like frogs, bugs, or a raging river, but they may look like that once a month direct deposit into our bank account, however large or small that might be. Or the diploma on your wall. Or the place on your wall that you wish it hung. Or maybe it looks like the living piece of metal that resides in your pocket. Or your own capacity to reason. Your strength to achieve and courage to stand tall in the face of adversity. In love, God silences us by knocking our legs out from underneath us, bringing us to our knees, that by stealing away our mistaken delusions of grandeur and self-sufficiency or our quiet sense of stability, he might lead us into submission to him. He knows that bowing down to those things will only bring slavery. And he loves us too much. To let us go on. And yet as we see God's activity here, we can find ourselves asking hard questions, right? How can God be good when he allows and even here says that he perpetrates calamity? How can that be? What does that say about his character? We want to be a church in which it is safe to ask those questions. And it makes sense that we would ask them if we're being honest with ourselves. But you can't do so in the echo chamber of your own heart and mind lest you lose yourself on the way. We need one another to enter into these difficult places in Scripture. And we need to pay attention to the rest of the story. For he brings us low that he might raise us up. He slays in order to save. And this is precisely what he does with the people of Israel. God silences and God rescues. The story of Le Miserable begins with one of the main characters, Jean Valjean, in prison. Then he's released and he finds himself homeless on the street but is taken in by a priest who clothes him, feeds him, gives him a warm place to sleep and the priest wakes up the next morning, if you know this story, only to find that Jean Valjean had stolen nearly all of his fine silver and fled. Jean Valjean is apprehended and brought back to the priest in order for him to press charges. And rather than seeing him brought to justice, the priest tells Jean Valjean that he forgot to take the most valuable pieces of all, the candlesticks. And this act of mercy changes Jean Valjean forever. It changes the rest of his story. He becomes a new man. The gracious rescue and pardon of the priest gave him a new identity, a new name, a new life. The angel of death is set to descend on the land of Egypt. Calamity is on its way for the Egyptians and for the Israelites. The angel of death was coming to all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt. 
But God has a plan to preserve his people and set them apart from the Egyptians. So what does he call them to do? What does he call his people to do? Fight? To flee? To cower? No. He calls them to pack their things and prepare a meal. A very special meal. One in which God sets the menu. One in which that will change the course of their story and give them a new identity, a new name, a new future. They were to prepare unleavened bread, bitter herbs, and a year old lamb. And once they killed the lamb, we read in verse 7, then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Verse 11, for I will... In this, man, sorry, in this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. I remember when we would go on long car trips with my family. I would sleep in my clothes for the next day because we would be leaving so early. I'd be ready to go. That's the image here. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. There was going to be a death in every household that night. It would either be the firstborn son or a lamb. God made a way for shelter from the storm. One in which a lamb would take the place of the firstborn. And once they smeared the blood over their doors, all they had to do was wait and watch the angel of death pass them by. All they had to do was rest in the Lord's sheltering grace and prepare to hit the road. And they did just that. They submitted to the Lord's provision in the sacrifice of a lamb that set them apart from the Egyptians as God's favored people. After centuries of slavery, in an evening, they were free. God was bringing them home, a home that had been promised to them years before, a home that was still foreign to them, though, a home that they had yet to come to. It was a long journey off, and at times their journey toward it would be brutal. It would be through the wilderness. They'd need a reminder of what just happened. And God gives them just that. God silences, God rescues, and God reminds. We are fast approaching one of the hallmark holidays in America, Thanksgiving. What's the central point of the whole day? A feast. Turkey, mashed potatoes, gravy, stuffing, which I actually don't like very much. Sorry. Cranberry sauce. Never had it. And of course, pumpkin pie or apple pie. Notice how I left out all the vegetables. The Thanksgiving meal is meaningful, though, to us because of the delicious food and the ensuing coma that comes from enjoying it, right? But even more, the meal is meaningful because of what it symbolizes. The meal ushers us into memories of past good, of how God has provided for us, which inevitably brings us joy in the present and leads us into hope for what is to come. 
In chapter 12, verse 51, we read that on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. On that very day. And then, only a few verses later, skip to chapter 14, verse 11. We hear the people of Israel say, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to bring us out of Egypt? The very next day, they were doubting God in fear and grumbling against him and against his servant, Moses. In a month, they would then go on to erect a self-made God who they would bow down to instead of the Lord, retracing their steps all the way back to Egypt. But the Lord knew the Israelites. He doesn't unchoose his people. The Lord knew that they would forget He knew what they needed, and so he instituted the Passover meal that would literally reshape their annual calendar. Look with me at verse 42 of chapter 12. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night, is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout the generations. They would replay their exodus from Egypt for generations to come. Every year they would slay a lamb. They would eat unleavened bread and bitter herbs to remind them of where they came from, the bitterness of their slavery, and the sheltering rescue that God had provided for them. And they would testify to their children year after year of the wonders that God had done for his people. Of his mighty arm. Of his steadfast love. But they ultimately made it to the promised land. And yet they continued to keep this feast. Why? They were delivered at that point. Finally delivered. They were home. They were at the home that they were looking forward to when they were first freed. What what were they still watching for? They were watching for a greater exodus. They may have been freed from the grip of Pharaoh, but they remained bound to the backbreaking weight of the law, the bitter grumbling of their hearts, and the prowling angel of death that comes for all those who rebel against the Lord. And so they watched. They waited. They groaned. And then we hear the cry of John the Baptist in the first chapter of John. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We read in Isaiah 53, he was bruised for our transgressions, crushed for our inequities. And as a lamb is silent, he was silent as he he was led to the slaughter. In Egypt, God sent an angel of death, the destroyer, to bring judgment on those who bowed down to Pharaoh. But God made a way of rescue for his people through the sacrifice of a lamb. In Jesus Christ, God replays the Passover. Except God doesn't steal a firstborn son, he gives his firstborn son. Furthermore, Jesus, the firstborn son of the father, refuses shelter from the angel of death. He didn't slay a lamb, but in love he became one. That those who hide under the shelter of his blood might receive life and freedom. Christ was silenced on the cross, brought low 
that we might be forgiven and freed and raised up. And now we know that by faith in him, any pain we experience, any, any tragedy that we see is not a punishment from God. For Christ took our place. All our questions about God's goodness that we spoke of earlier in the midst of what seems like only death must be asked at the foot of the cross where God in the flesh died for us. Even more, we behold the empty tomb. For just as Christ is the firstborn slain son of God, he is the firstborn of the dead, he's also the risen lamb who is the first fruits of the resurrection, testifying to what would come for all those who are united to him by faith. We belong to him, and therefore we receive the rights of the firstborn, the forever love of the Father, the future inheritance of a forever home that is unlike the home that we dwell in. If this is true, then why are we a people wrought with anxiety about the future, angst about the present, and often shame and regret about the past? Why do we grumble about why God isn't ma is making our lives uncomfortable or that he's not doing the things for me that I asked him to do? Why do we sometimes remain under this burden of guilt and the anguish of loneliness? Because just like the Israelites, we live with a bad case of spiritual amnesia. We are plagued by worry that we perpetrate on ourselves. We find ourselves with grumbling hearts because we've forgotten the radical, lavish grace of God. We've forgotten the cross where Christ showed us the power of self-giving love. In our forgetfulness, we wander and find quick fixes to shelter us from the pain that plagues us, only to find that we fall deeper and deeper into bondage. We forget our past, but also our future. And our forgetfulness taints the in-between. So what do we do about it? We muster up strength and figure it out. Just do more and try harder. What's the essential call of the Christian? remember. We remember. And we're changed in our remembering. We remember the gospel, the redemption story. That's quite unlike an underdog story. This story is about the powerless who were freed by the blood of a lamb. Every time we come together in worship, as Ben was testifying to, we are remembering together. We're stepping out of all the other anxiety-invoking stories we live in, and we're remembering the greater story, the story that brings rest and comfort and freedom and hope, the truer story. When we gather in our community groups, we gather in order to remember. We study the Bible to remember. We pray to remember. And just as God gave the Israelites a meal to remember, Jesus gives us one too. So we're going to take the Lord's Supper together, appropriately so. And so if you would grab the cups in the pew. you read through the gospel account of Matthew, we come to the precipice of the passion narrative where Jesus would go and be the slain lamb 
of God and would rise again. And on that precipice, Jesus eats the Passover meal with his disciples and moves into that next week and is slain. And this is what he says. Now, as they were reading, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after breaking it and blessing it, he gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. Let's do that together. Then he took a cup, which actually was the cup of redemption. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's do that together. He went on to say, I tell you that I will not drink again of this fruit of the the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In the Lord's Supper, we replay the past and we rehearse for the future feast in God's kingdom. We remember in order to hope for the day when We will be finally and fully free, home forever in the house of the Lord. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you stepped into our place. You died the death that we ought to have died. And you rose again that we might rise. And you reign with the Father in his kingdom. And we pray that you would give us hope, that you would help us to remember as we await that day, as we journey together in the wilderness. As we're sometimes led into grumbling, Lord, help us to return and remember your steadfast love. That you might be magnified in us and that the world would know that you are Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song uh, that worships Christ for who he is as our sacrificed lamb who stands in our place. So if you would raise your voices and worship with us. And 
offer up this sacrifice for every sin our Savior died and the Lord of life can be contained our God has risen from the grave oh our God has risen from the grave behold the Lamb the story of redemption written on his hands Jesus you will reign Death is done. We'll see your face bright as the sun. We'll bow before the King of Kings. Oh God, forever we will sing. The story of redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Behold the Lamb. mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more what love could remember no we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest 
the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Sing this. And praise the Lord, His mercy is more. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Hear these words of blessing as you go from here today. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you go from here today, just a few brief things. If you would uh, take that communion cup and uh, there will be a place where you can throw it out outside the door, that would be a great help to us. As well, at our church on communion Sundays, we take a second offering called our benevolence offering. And this offering goes towards meeting the needs of those in our church family and our community that fall outside of our normal budget. And so if you would like to give towards that, uh, there will be a place you can give towards that on the outside, or you could write a check, mark it benevolence, and put it in our normal offering boxes as well as you leave. You're dismissed. Have a great week.